there is this confusion. There are some scriptures that talk about Buddha not being a vegetarian. It is said that Buddha ate meat. He himself said, as long as that animal is not killed for me, exclusively for me, if it is just served as food, I have no problem. I can eat meat. This is in the scriptures. And yet, for majority of the followers of Buddha, vegetarianism and staying away from consuming meat is to follow the Buddha. They cannot even imagine consuming meat. Now, how do we understand this? Who is right? Which scripture is right? Are the scriptures lying when they say that Buddha had no problem consuming meat as long as it was not killed for him? This is what happened. Early Buddhists had no problem consuming meat. They only emphasized on not killing. If the meat is served as food, if it is all, if the animal is already killed, and if it is not exclusively killed for them, they had no problem consuming meat. There was no concept of vegetarianism in Buddhism. And this all changed in China when one emperor, the most important Chinese emperor who embraced Buddhism, embraced vegetarianism. He happened to be a vegetarian. He looked at Buddha's teachings. He interpreted not eating meat and not killing quite literally. He put both these things together. And then he declared that eating meat is banned. If you are a Buddhist, if you are following the way of the Buddha, you cannot eat meat. And after Emperor Wu, Buddhism is totally vegetarian. Just think about it, how one individual powerful enough, who's been given the authority to rule over people and how his own personal ideas can become a way of life for one whole community of people. So much so that they can even go against the teachings of Buddha. Buddha never said, don't eat meat. He only said, don't kill. How simple spirituality is. How simple following the path is. And how complicated we make it. In a way, this is what deters many from walking the Buddha's path, walking an enlightened path, because each and every idea, simple words, have been converted into dogmatic rules. So when a young mind wanting to learn about itself is introduced to the world of practice, meditation, spirituality, the concepts are so rigid, they're so binding that an individual feels restricted. It feels like unless I am willing to restrict myself, change my habits, deny certain things, 
things that are very dear to me, things that are very fundamental to my way of living. If I have eaten meat all my life, now here I have to accept a path where I have to stop eating meat. And I should stop having sex. I should deny comforts of life. Now right there, you are not helping an individual to embrace the path. You're actually making it more difficult. Buddha never said any of these. It's because we did not understand what he was trying to say and the teachings have passed through many minds, many influential minds, they've become distorted. They don't mean exactly the same thing as what they were supposed to mean. When you truly don't understand something, you have to turn it into a rule. That is why Buddhism, depending on which branch of Buddhism you're following, you have to follow a set of rigid rules. You cannot imagine becoming a Buddhist monk without shaving your head, without wearing orange robes. What if I don't want to? I simply want to understand Buddha. I don't want to be a Buddhist. I just want to directly connect with Buddha's teachings. I want to get rid of all this intermediary nonsense. When you start rebelling against all the unnecessary things that are blocking your way to the Buddha, Zen is born. Zen is a rebellion against distortion of Buddha's teachings. Buddha's original words were extraordinarily simple. He said, you are nothing but your mind. There is no self. There is no you anywhere there. Watch your actions, watch your thoughts. You will see there is just an endless stream of activity. One after another, after another. Your body keeps on doing things. Your mind keeps on doing things. And amidst of all these activities, once in a while, you wake up and you say, this is me. I am doing this. Now that I isn't real. It is just a part of the same mentation. It is the part of the same identification. Liberation from that I is Nirvana, is enlightenment. Zen is only about that. Zen is the purest part of Buddha's teachings. Without all the external attachments and detachments that have been added. Because Buddhism became the state religion in China. It was used as a way of unification of the people. For Emperor Wu, it was a way of connecting people. It was a way of giving them some sense of equality that if you are able to practice these set of beliefs, if you are able to stay diligent for to these habits and practices, then you would acquire the merits for your next life. The idea of right and wrong became more important than self-realization. See, an emperor is living in his own world. Even when he is embracing 
so-called spiritual way of life, he is accepting it in his own way. He is still very much a worldly man who is stuck in ideas of right and wrong, whose daily affairs are about dealing with the struggles of life. And if he can be given a promise, if he can be, if you can get something that can automatically help you to connect with something deeper without you putting in the effort. The word merit, if you can perform actions in a certain way, if you don't meet, eat meat, you will acquire merit. If you feed the bhikshus, you will acquire merit. If you build temples for the monks, you will acquire merit. Now that is what the emperor is looking for because he's obsessed with doing. He's obsessed with creating things. But he still wants to be a spiritual man. He still wants to experience what Buddha has experienced. So he wants a shortcut. Acquiring merit is the shortcut. That is how spiritual teachings become religious preaching. When someone is not willing to practice it, but still want to claim the benefit of it, then you play with words. Same thing has happened with Christianity. Same thing has happened with Hinduism. Majority of the followers of these major religions don't do things that their teachers wanted them to do. They are continuing to do the same things they want to do, but they have arranged their lives around words so carefully that they live in the sense of false delusion, false comfort that they are doing what Jesus wanted them to do, what Krishna wanted them to do, what Buddha wanted them to do. They have picked up those things that can easily be followed without much effort, 